Casper. So good morning, everyone. This is the Connecticut Paid Leave Policy and Personnel Committee. Today is Tuesday, August 2nd, 2022, and it's roughly 9.18 in the morning. At this point, uh, we do not have a quorum, so um, I'm just gonna go through the welcome and ask Amber to do a, a call to order. Okay, um, Daryl Duzinski. Present. Mike Soltis. Present. Uh, Britt Marie Cole Johnson and Holly Williams will not be joining us today. And Ava Bermuda Zimmerman is not in attendance. So we do not have a quorum. Thank you, Amber. Acknowledging um, our public members and welcome. We'll skip, uh, well, um, any, any discussions on the minutes from Michael? I don't have any, Michael, do you? No, but I was absent, so I would Very abstain good. if we were to vote. Got it. Thank you, sir. The next item is a discussion with Michael Cesar on the regarding the proposed revisions uh, to policies, sole proprietorship, uh, sole proprietors, self-employed individuals, holiday shutdowns, and employers transitioning to and from private plans. Thank you so much, and hopefully everyone. Uh, received the actual um, language of the policies, the red line version for any changes, and then the new language for the uh, new policies. Um, I'd like to run through them really quickly, and I will share my screen. Um, I apologize. This is going to be a very boring um, PowerPoint. Uh, it's not the most exciting thing, but at least we'll have something to react to as you can look at and not just listen to me ramble on about the policies. Um, so as you mentioned, Daryl, there were three kind of categories of policies we're recommending. Um, some is just clarifying what the original language was intended to be. Some might be slightly new. Um, the first category is around that sole proprietors and self-employed individuals electing to enroll in the program. Um, there's a few that are few minor changes that are just typos or citation references in the language. Um, so just kind of clarifying that, that's not addressed here, but that's also in the language. The first real category of changes is around the effective dates for enrolled sole props and self-employed individuals. Um, the original language is kind of unclear. It just talks about kind of coverage dates. So we thought it be, would be best to really spell out what we mean by coverage and kind of break it into when contributions are owed versus when benefits can be received by sole props and self-employed individuals. So just kind of making it clear that the date you register, whatever calendar quarter that is, contributions are owed for that quarter. Um, they'll be owed the, on the same schedule as any other um, individual contributing, you know, due at the end of the month with a one month grace or end of the quarter with a one month grace period. Um, but it is owed for that entire calendar quarter uh, on the date you register. And then benefits as previously adopted um, would kind of be eligible for benefits three months following the date registered as of the first of that following month. So that's kind of the first category of changes, really just clarifying the original intent. Uh, second category involves early termination without penalty. So our statute kind of requires a three-year enrollment period for any sole proprietors or self-employed individuals and with sort of a one-year re-up after that. Um, but it also grants the power to the authority to kind of define other ways that uh, an individual can, can leave the program. So we do have an option for leaving with penalties. Um, and this is sort of new policies related to waiving those penalties. The first one is just the same sort of waiver that we have um, for equity and good conscience that we have for any other penalties, just kind of officially adopting that policy. It's one of our recommendations. The other is allowing a retroactive withdrawal. Um, we've received a couple of requests, a couple, more than a couple, um, from a couple of requests from sole props who didn't realize what they were enrolling in, didn't understand how the program worked. Maybe they thought they had to enroll and that's why they registered with us. So we've gotten some requests to um, kind of withdraw back to the date that they were registered. So this is just officially adopting a policy that allows us to do that. Um, as long as they, if they receive benefits, they do pay back any benefits they received under the program. So just kind of making that official. The next category is withdrawal, um, early withdrawal due to lack of eligibility. Uh, so there's two requirements that are in play here. One is if, if our statute requires um, sole proprietors and self-employed individuals to be to reside in Connecticut. So if they move outside of Connecticut, they 
they would no longer be eligible for benefits. Um, that's different than you know the, the regular employees that are enrolled, where there's no resident residency requirement. So this is just allowing those sole proprietors and self-employed individuals to officially withdraw because they've moved out of Connecticut. Um, and what the process would be and, and the ability for us to request proof of their new residency. Similarly, if they're, if they're closing their business and they wanna withdraw for that purpose prior to the end of that three year period, um, we'd have a similar process. This time they'd provide proof of their business closing. Um, it's very similar to what we do for employers who no longer have employees in Connecticut, but maybe the proof might be slightly different. The other, thing, the other option that's always available to uh, individuals who are sole props or self-employed, um, they can just wait out the end of the three-year period if they want. Report zeros for income if they have zero dollars for income and just kind of withdraw at the end. But this is sort of, they want to close their books. They don't want to keep their registration open with us. We have these options available to them. The fourth category under this um, group is a rule about individuals who have who are registered then withdraw and now want to re-register. Um, we are asking for a waiting period of at least four calendar quarters before they're able to re-enroll. Basically, we wanna make sure that they're not leaving the program when they owe contributions and then coming back in when they wanna collect benefits. Um, so just kind of having a little bit of a requirement that um, make sure they're not manipulating their time they're enrolled in the program uh, for that purpose. And then the last category is probably the most important since it will come up on every single claim, just identifying specifically what we use as proof of income for sole proprietors and self-employed individuals. Um, we, our preferred option is the Schedule C tax form. And we specifically identify the line on that form we would use. That's the closest we have to what, what regular wages would be. Um, if Schedule C is not available, we'd use Schedule SE. Um, and similarly, it's the line that, that closely most closely adopts uh, or reflects their regular wages. And then we have language essentially allowing us to make reasonable assumptions about those tax forms because they may be provided on a calendar year basis. Um, they may not reflect the exact you know, base period that the claim would apply to. So we can make assumptions based on that. And then also because it's potentially a calendar year basis, distributing that income across quarters. Um, so just allowing us that option. That's sort of it for sole props. I'm gonna pause for a second if there's any questions about the policies um, related to these individuals. Michael, how do you, and you don't, you don't necessarily have to respond if it's um, opening up vulnerabilities, but how do you validate that the form submitted by the claimant IRS forms um, are, are legitimate? It's a good question. I think we have the ability to request information from the DRS. Um, I don't know if we're gonna do that in every claim. Um, we're still in, in probably in discussions about the actual process, but we do have that ability to request information. Um, I don't know, Aaron, if you have any thoughts on additional um, steps we might take. We, we do have the, as Michael said, we do have the ability to validate um, information with revenue services, which is a helpful source, particularly with the sole props. Um, I think it's right now being done on a as needed basis if there are any sort of indicia of concern um, because we're the ones who have access to the DRS database, not AFLAC. So they, they'll notify us if there's an issue. But it, you know, and I think we continue to take steps to try to validate the information and to come up with more sort of repeatable and kind of automatic steps. Soul props are, are tricky. The thing that is helpful at this point in time is that it's a very small population. So we do have the ability to kind of give them a little bit extra attention when they when they file. It's, it's a work in progress. And then the other thing, we, it won't necessarily be available at the time of claim, but there's an expectation that we should see similar income provided for contribution purposes. Um, you know, they, they may be paying on different schedules, but there's a possibility of you know, reviewing what they provided to us for contributions in reflecting what we paid for benefits. Yeah. Um, so this, that's also another option. Thank you. Thank you. So Michael, I have a question for you. Sure. Um, <clears throat> 
concerning, uh, there's a line and you mentioned this, penalties could be waived if they're against equity and good conscience. And my question is, I guess there's a couple of parts. Number one, who makes that determination? Number two, do we have or do we intend to have any guidance on that? Because I don't think there's any universal, universally accepted definition of equity and good conscience. Yes, that's a great question. Um, and at this point, we don't have standards we're kind of going to be using as like the go forward, here's what you look at, here's how you make a decision. Um, the language is really intended to mirror what's already in our statute. Um, related to penalties for misrepresentation or fraud. So it's kind of like leaving that option open to us. Uh, I suspect as we continue to operate and potentially waive penalties or not waive penalties, we'll establish a sort of um, standard through that process. Um, but really right now, I think the language is intended to give us flexibility. And it's sort of, you know when it's appropriate. Um, there's no reason why we would be, it, it would be harmful to the individual and no gain to us. Uh, that's sort of the standard I'm thinking of, but you know where the line is drawn might take some time to, to kind of make that determination based on the scenarios we see in front of us. And, and who makes that determination? So it would be the authority. Um, I think we'll we officially have the power in um, whoever our chief uh, executive officer is, so Andrea at the moment, but she can obviously delegate it as well. Um, it'll likely reside in um, Aaron or myself, in the law department um, is likely the one who would make the determination, but the authority can be given, is granted to Andrea to give to whom she sees fit in the authority. All right, thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, so that was it for the sole proprietor self-employed individuals. Uh, the next category is holiday and shutdown policy. This is really just trying to clarify what was already in the policy previously. We did a lot of research um, our intent is to match FMLA as much as possible for how, how they treat holidays and shutdowns and have paid leave kind of reflect that. Um, some information, there's a lot of information about some scenarios, but then a surprising absence of information about some more complicated scenarios. So um, this is really just codifying and really laying it out as descriptive as possible. Um, this may be one of the better places to go to as far as how FMLA works for for holidays and shutdowns because it's, it was so difficult to find this type of information um, that, that we kind of wrote for the policy. So there are basically three rules, um, three scenarios that were listed. The first is if there's a holiday or shutdown that is equal to or exceeds the regular schedule for that employee for that calendar week. In other words, there's no days during that calendar week in which the employee would have been expected to be working because of that holiday or shutdown. Under that, scenario, no paid leave benefits would be payable. Um, I think in the, I use an example of you normally work Monday to Friday and the company shuts down Sunday to Saturday. Um, you wouldn't have been expected to work, therefore there's no benefits available to you. That's scenario one. Scenario two is where your paid leave is approved for the full week, full calendar week, but, and is a holiday shutdown for less than that week. So you normally work Monday to Friday, you're approved for paid leave Monday to Friday, and it just so happens that Wednesday is a holiday. In that case, you wouldn't notice any difference in your paid leave claim. You'd be paid for the full week, um, regardless of the holiday being there or not. And this is one, this is well defined in FMLA regulations. Um, that's obvious. The third category, it's hard to find great guidance on this. We did find some, um, but it was, I was surprised at how off, how little this was ever discussed. Um, in areas. So this is the scenario where there's a holiday or shutdown for less than a week and the approved paid leave is for less than the calendar week. Um, in other words, there are some days in which the employee would be on paid leave, some days in which the employee would be expected to work, and there's a, ho a holiday or shutdown for less than a week. Um, the way that that would work is the specific days of the holiday or shutdown are not days in which paid leave benefits are available. And there is no change to the regular schedule for that employee, you know, what days they'd be expected to work uh, had there not been a paid uh, reason for paid leave. So 
if you're looking at like um, a fraction in a math problem, we change the numerator, the number of days on paid leave, but not the denominator, the no total number of days you'd be working. Um, or alternatively, we would just say, paid leave is only available on days in which you would have been expected to work, but we do not adjust your regular schedule. Um, example of this is, you normally work Monday to Friday, you're approved for paid leave for Monday and Tuesday. So two fifths of your week, you would have been on paid leave. And it just so happens there is a holiday on Monday. In that case, Monday and Tuesday you're approved for paid leave, but Monday's a holiday. So only Tuesday is payable. So you're, you've got one day of paid leave out of the five days total that you would have been expected to work. Um, so it went from, if there were no holiday, it'd be two fifths. Because it's a holiday, it's one fifth. And benefits will be paid um, based on one fifth of a week's of benefits. So I don't know if that was easy to understand. I feel like I've rambled for a while, but um, that's that. And hopefully, the examples in the language um, provides guidance and, and makes it clear how this would work. The other kind of half of that is if you if the employee works on holidays, they're in a position where holidays and shutdowns don't impact their schedule. There is no change to paid leave for that circumstance. They're just treated as regular work days for them. Um, if they happen to get this extra like holiday pay, we'll also, we wouldn't consider that as kind of a concurrent benefit being received as long as it wasn't replacing their regular income. So I think I use in the example in the, in the language, if you get double time on holiday, as holiday pay, one time for working, one time as holiday pay. And while you're on paid leave, you just get that holiday pay and not, you know, so in other words, you get like one time your pay. We wouldn't factor that into your regular into your paid leave benefit. Um, it's sort of not concurrent benefit payment because it's not replacing the income that we're replacing. Um, so that's sort of it for holidays and shutdowns. I'll pause again if there's any questions about it. Hopefully it made sense, um, but please let me know if it did not. Uh, this is Mike. I just have a quick question. Uh, does the, the Department of Labor have regs on this particular issue? There, there are regs about it, and I think it may, maybe like a second scenario is specifically spelled out for Connecticut. I can't remember if it's Connecticut or federal, um, but I did not, could not find scenarios specifically spelling out each one of these. And it was really that third scenario and whether you adjust the regular schedule or, or what gets adjusted, what doesn't. So I couldn't find anything that had this many examples spelled out, codified in law. Okay, interesting. Yeah, I recall looking for this years ago, over the years, and, and not seeing a lot of guidance. So this might be the most comprehensive uh, collection of guidance uh, out there, which is great. Um, so it sounds like, as we sit here today, we're not aware of any conflict between this draft and anything in the federal or state FMLA leave. That's correct. This is our intent to, to mirror it as much as obviously the FMLA doesn't have payments associated with it. So there's a little bit added onto that, but it's, it's really intended to capture the same kind of rules that apply for FMLA. Thanks. Thank you. And then the last, I realized inputs in slideshow mode. Um, the last uh, set of policies is related to the transition between um, the public program and private plans or vice versa between private plans and the public program. A lot of this is really just um, officially documenting what's what's already been in place since we have had a couple transition periods, you know, uh, first of second quarter and the first of the third quarter, we did have some private plans that began. So we had employees already under the public program who shifted to the private, but this is just officially documenting it and, and hopefully adopting it as our policy. The first category is just general rules for all transitions. Um, it would be our expectation that at the time of the transition from one program to the other, all open claims, basically that we mean, that means anyone who's on paid leave before the transition, during the transition, and after the transition in one continuous leave, we would expect that those requests would terminate on the date of the transition and that the new um, plan, whether it's the public program or private plan, would then take on those claims. So the individual will be able to apply for benefits under the new plan. Um, they would be able to request the documentation they provided originally to help them file under the new plan. Um, but that would be our expectation, sort of a default for all claims and sort of set the, the line in the sand 
from this moment, now you're res the responsibility of the, the new program. A couple of specific rules about the transition from the public program to private plan. So brand new private plan being formed. Um, one policy we would like to adopt is that, that while active employees would go who are on uh, paid leave, would go to the new plan, anyone who's no longer employed by them, but still on leave, um, would still be the responsibility of the public program. Uh, this could be that they were terminated prior to the paid leave and you know, were it within that 12 week period that they could still file benefits um, for that employ under that employment. And then there's a transition that happens, that might be one scenario, or they were employed at the time we approved the original claim, but maybe they ran out of FMLA time in the middle of the paid leave claim, the employer terminated them, and then the transition happens. Under both of those circumstances, we would allow that individual to remain under the public plan rather than have to go with the private plan where there's no longer that connection with the employer. Um, the one requirement we have is we need to have notice of that, um, particularly in that second scenario I mentioned where they were employed at the time we approved it, and then they were terminated during the course of the claim. We may not know that. Um, we're hopeful that they would tell us, but we kind of need to be told that in order to avoid terminating that claim. We do make efforts to reach out to every claimant to let them know what's happening. So that is an opportunity for them to tell us, hey, I'm no longer employed by the employer, um, but you know, it's not gonna happen automatically. We kind of need to get that notice. And then if they're terminated after the transition, date, that's still a responsibility of the private plan uh, of, or the new plan. The other portion of this that we're officially asking to be adopted is um, private plans are allowed to, but they're not required to deduct for paid leave used under the public program as part of their private plan, only if that time was used with that specific employer if they had multiple employment, other employers or multiple employment at the same time, they can't consider time taken from those other employers. And also the time must be within the 12 month period that the private plan utilizes. In other words, if the private plan uses like the calendar year method for calculating the 12 month period and the transition happens on January 1st, well then they can't consider any prior time because any time used the prior calendar year wouldn't count towards that. On the other hand, if they're using a rolling 12 month period, similar to what the public plan uses, then there's possibility that they're allowed to deduct prior usage um, under the new, new plan. All that said, the authorities is not gonna be able to provide many details about the past utilization beyond our standard you know, approval notice we provide to employers. We wouldn't be able to break it down for the employers. This individual used this much time from you, this much time from another employer, the employer can work that out with the employee, but we just won't have the ability to provide that kind of level of information. So if, they're, if they decide to deduct prior time usage, there's some work that they'll have to do on their end. Um, and it's obviously the requirements I mentioned above. Then the, the alternate scenario, so now shifting to, it was under a private plan, it's now under the public program. Um, some of the rules that we would, we're hoping to adopt are that Transitioning claims will use the public program plan design. In other words, the minimum requirements under the statute and not any enhanced benefits that may have been under the initial claim with the private plan. You know, for example, if they were getting 100% wage replacement under the private plan, when they transition to the public program, we're not gonna continue that 100%. We're gonna pay based on the 95 and 60% formula that we use. Um, similarly, if the employee has you know, when they transition, they have multiple employers that are under paid leave from, um, will kind of readjust their claim to reflect their combined schedule from both, uh, from all employers who are participating in the public program. So, you know, if, there's, if someone had two employers at the same time were on leave from both, one was under the private plan, one was under the public program, they were two separate claims. And then if the private plan transitions, those kind of get combined into one claim we find the schedule for that one claim and adjust. So there may be some differences in what the benefit amounts are at the date of the transition, both for that first rule and the second one. Um, but there's a little bit of calculation has to be done. Uh, so they may not, they may notice a difference in what they're being paid. One thing we're requesting and always we're asking for the, op for the ability to request is in order to assist us in opening those new claims under the public program, 
potentially asking for employers to complete see all the employment verification forms at the date of transition rather than having individuals have to go to their employers one by one um, and then submit it to us. Alternatively, we can potentially, if there's a large enough employer or, it's, or there's, um, that would even be burdensome, maybe asking for some other documentation, give us a spreadsheet of every employee on claim, what their schedule is and kind of the same information that would be on the employment verification form. Basically trying to find ways to ease the burden of that kind of refiling of the claim under us. So that's kind of adopting a policy that gives us that, that power to do that. And then the last category, um, kind of the opposite of what the private plan does. Under the public program, we're just not going to count any prior paid leave used under the private plan when they transition to us. Um, there's, it's complex to do that. There's a lot of administrative difficulties, IT difficulties to do that kind of work. And we just felt at the end of the day, it wasn't worth it. So we're just kind of allowing them to say, we're gonna ignore any time use of the prior plan, and kind of start with us without that information being taken into account. So that, that's sort of it for the, the recommended policies related to the transition. Um, any questions about this or about any other policies? Michael, when you talk about the employee providing um, notice that they were terminated, um, what, what kind of documentation are you expecting from the employee to provide that proof? It's a good question. We, we might want to add that to the policy. I think we can obviously ask for an employment verification form again um, with the employer officially documenting the termination date. Um, that might feel like a little bit much. So maybe it's simply we confirm with the employer. I believe we're reaching out to both the employees and employer at, that, at the transition time. Um, so it might be worth kind of as long as both confirm, um, whether it be verbal or in writing, that might be enough. But uh, let me take that back. Okay. I'm just referencing the Labor Department has a statute which requires employers to provide a separation notice, separation packet. We used to call it the pink slip. Um, a lot of employers don't comply, um, but it, it's something that you may want to utilize. Uh, it, it's possible. You'd have to look at it. I mean, it's specific about being terminated and reasons and so forth. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, so maybe that'll be one of the things we can accept. Um, we could accept that along with our documentation, but yeah, I can definitely add that to our language. Well, for at least for review. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions for Michael? Thanks, Michael, on the sole proprietor, self-employment individuals, holiday shutdowns, and employers transitioning to and from. Um, Aaron, is it okay? Is it proper to go back to the agenda item number two and review uh, and ask for an approval for July 7th since Ava has joined us? Um, I was thinking we could just defer it since Michael said he was gonna have to abstain anyway. So it maybe makes sense to, to wait until next month when um, Harley and Britt Marie hopefully will also be in attendance. Okay, that's great. So we'll defer the review and approval of the July 7th, 2022 meeting minutes. Proceed to agenda number four, discussion regarding proposed revisions to the authority bylaws with Aaron. Thank you so much. Um, Amber, could you let me share my screen? And while Amber's doing that, I'll just share that we do intend to ask the full board to give us permission to post the policies that Michael just described with the bylaws um, in the plan of operations. We will not be asking that. Um, we're, we wanted to give the, we're gonna, um, wanted to give, have this discussion with you today. And then um, two things, one bylaws affect the, particularly the proposed changes affect the board members directly. So we wanna make sure everyone has plenty of time into the um, August Board of Directors meeting. Already has a lot on its plate. Um, so we're just going to um, plan on talking about the plan policy. Sorry, I need to do something to my screen here. Let me try this again. Um, so we'll talk about the bylaws and the plan of operations today, but we won't bring these to the board on, for permission to post until September. All right. 
<clears throat> please disregard the typo on the screen. Um, in terms of the bylaws, hopefully they will come up in a moment. I don't know why they keep going away. There. Okay. Um, there is a provision in the bylaws that require the board to review them every three years, at least every three years. Um, we don't have a lot of proposed changes, but we, we identified a couple that make sense to us. First is to include a reference to CT paid leave authority and the authority in the um, beginning of the bylaws where they specify that our official legal name is the Connecticut Paid Family and Medical Leave Insurance Authority. Um, we rarely use that name because it's just so long. So we just want to include the CT paid leave authority and the authority um, as equivalents. Second, um, in our statute, it specifies the attendance requirements in terms of um, for members who are not ex officio members. So excluding the members who are who present because they represent an, a state agency. Um, if you fail to attend um, three meetings in a row or if you miss more than 50% of the year, you could be deemed to have resigned. The, there are two things we'd like to clarify with that. The statute and, and the bylaws do not specify what meetings we're talking about. And so we think it makes sense to clarify that we mean both the board of directors meetings as well as meetings of committees um, for which the director is an assigned member. Um, so we think that would make sense. And then the other thing um, in furtherance of our overall mission is that we would never want to um, penalize anyone for any absence that's actually due to an FMLA covered reason or um, Family Violence Leave Act covered reason. So we thought those were two um, useful things that would clarify the bylaws. Thirdly, um, the statute and the bylaws specify that the board can, um, by resolution, identify any staff member to um, have signatory authority which is fine, but we would also like there to be the ability for the CEO herself to delegate signature authority instead of requiring a board resolution. Um, just as a preview, we will be asking the board to adopt a resolution giving um, some of us on the staff signatory authority, but in the future, it would be um, sort of operationally convenient if the CEO can do that delegation. This is consistent with what agency directors already do. They have that ability without um, having to go back to the governor. And then finally, we would just like to clean up some of the references to the Public Act to include the new statu the statutory citations. When we adopted the bylaws, um, the Public Act had not yet been engrossed, and so we kept referencing PA 1925, but now we have statutory sites, which just is my particular bugaboo. I like to use the statutory citations. Any questions or discussion about the bylaws? I have a question and mm -hmm. thank you for doing this. It's good to revisit these from time to time because otherwise, you know, you prove them once and then forget. But my question uh, with the attendance changes, I'm just curious, I presume somebody monitors this. Yes. Um, Amber and I pay attention to um, who who are present at the meetings. Okay, um, and and I presume if somebody hits the triggers, what happens next? <laughs> so, um, so far we have not enforced this provision. We have. Um, certainly reached out to people if they have missed meetings that we weren't expecting them to miss um, to just sort of see if there's an issue. Uh, it's not something that has been enforced. Um, it is something that we think the board itself, um, you know, may want to start enforcing. 
but technically if someone misses um you know more than three we could um indicate that we're so what has happened in the past is when that's come up, we've talked to the person and said, are you still interested? Are you still able? They say, yes. We say, okay, please make a better job, <laughs> make more attempts to attend. Um, sometimes they have said no, and that's when they have resigned and we've talked to the appointing authority about appointing somebody new. Uh, sh should we have a more formal process? to enforce this, um, you know, assuming somebody hits the triggers, um, or do we want to have your informal process? I guess that's my question. Um, so it's a little, I think, I think having the board discuss having a more formal process would be great. It is a little tricky for us um, on the staff mm -hmm. because you know guys are our supervisors right. um so i i do think that trying to um clarify the attendance requirements is a good first step and then um you know maybe having a more um more specific process for um in, into following up when people are not attending would be useful. Again, if this is really kind of an opportunity to raise the issue with the board members and have that conversation, and then we can go ahead and implement it. But I, I think clarifying the requirements is a good first step. Absolutely, absolutely. And I, I do agree, uh, it could put you in an awkward position. Um, to informally enforce it. So I think we should have a, it should be on the board's agenda. Uh, how do we want to handle this? Um, my second observation is just, um, we take a look at 7.4, uh, the fourth line down, I think there should be a comma between business and trust. And that's just a knit. Um, and and that's, that's, those are the only comments I had on uh, the bylaws. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. And we'll, we'll make that, that addition. I always can count on you for, <laughs> for your eagle eye. If you do make a change, I think you have, you'll have trust twice. So take a look at that because you have, okay. you have trust after you state. So if it is business trust as written, or if it's just business, um, to Michael's point on the attendance, you know, as as we are a board, we're aware and committee, we're aware of our attendance requirements, or at least we should be. Um, maybe it's nice once a year that the board uh, chair reminds the uh, parties, the the members of the attendance. But I also think that because there's exceptions to uh, being removed based on um, conditions of, uh, you know, personal conditions. Um, I think having the, the, a board member reach, uh, I'm sorry, authority member reach out to the board member um, and inquire, uh, you know, generally is, is, a, is a very fair concept. If, you know, and then from there, it, it should be raised to the board. Um, it's a delicate situation, but I, I I think as you're working through this over the last, I can't believe it's three years already, um, you know, your best practices should be formalized. But I, I, I'm pleased to know that you, you at least tr attempt to reach out to see if there's a concern with the individual um, because they did make the commitment and, and they should be held accountable. But there's always exceptions, um, especially when it comes to personal reasons. So thank you. Okay, thank you. And then on the plan of operations, <coughs> which we've looked at before, um, but again, we just think it makes sense to kind of just make sure that they're um, current. We really didn't have too much except to um, get rid of those last few references to PFMLIA, which 
we really haven't used since December of 2019. Um, and um, to clean up some of the references to the paid leave trust fund, which is kind of part and parcel. If you get rid of the PFMLIA references, you also have to clean that up for the trust fund. But we didn't really see anything else in the plan of operations that you know, called out to us as needing a change. Thanks, Aaron. Any any concerns or questions on the changes of the plan of operations? Okay. And Aaron, just to confirm, the plan of operations and the bylaws would be um, held for a September um, notice to the board to post. Yes. So what we can do is share these revisions, proposed revisions, with the full board but we won't ask them to take it up at the August board meeting. We'll give them the month to review and we'll take it up in September. Okay. And, and going back to Michael's presentation, um, those three concepts will be requested to post um, in this yes. month's board meeting. That is correct. Thank you. And just as a preview, um, with some of the legislation that passed this spring, we will need to revise the employee manual. So that'll be on the lookout just to add um, individuals who, the language in the statute is victims of domestic violence, right. um, will be a protected class. So we'll add that. That'll be part of the employee handbook. Okay. So that's a preview for the fall. Wonderful, thank you. Any old business? None. New business. None. Looking for a motion to adjourn. Move to adjourn, Mike. Ava, we have a second. <laughs> I'm in a second, that, yeah. We have a second, that. <laughs> Great to see you. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. 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 No abstentions. All right. Motion carries. Everyone, it's 10 o'clock, August 2nd. Have a great day and week. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you, Bye-bye.